We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm director of the Foley Institute. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our, our event today. It's part of our ongoing series on the politics of, of, of climate change. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Dylan Bugden. Dylan received his PhD from the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at Cornell University in 2019. And since that time, he's been here at WSU as the Boeing Distinguished Assistant Professor of Environmental Sociology. His work addresses issues of contentious environmental politics, including conflicts over hydraulic fracturing, the effects of environmental activism and protest, and the dynamics of the environmental justice movement. Dylan's work focuses on partisanship and polarization as key features of environmental politics. His work has appeared in leading journals such as Social Problems, Climate Change, or Climatic Change, Environmental Politics, and Environmental Research Letters. That's just to name a few of his publications. So join me now in welcoming Dylan, Bu Dylan Bugden to the affiliate. That's like a maneuver around here? Yeah, not too far because you'll be up on oh, camera. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's a, a little, I don't like to stand still. Those of you who have me in class will immediately recognize that. Um, anyway, thank you all for being here. It's great to see such a, a large and diverse audience. Uh, I recognize one person from the farmer's market. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. We've chatted a little bit about climate policy and climate politics. Uh, lots of faculty, lots of students, grad students. Um, one of you is probably going to get a call out here at some point about your own research. Um, anyway, uh, as Cornell mentioned, today I really want to talk about partisanship and climate change. Uh, most of you intuitively, at the very least, understand that one of, if not the key barrier to dealing with climate change, at least in the United States, is partisanship. That Republicans and Democrats the elephants and the donkeys just don't get along, and they can't reconcile their differences on this particular issue. And because we're in a college classroom, most of you probably blame Republicans for that, rightly. That's totally fine. But what partisanship is really about is about the difference across these two groups, these two political groups. Um, interestingly enough, I think a lot of the ways that you probably understand this dynamic are a little problematic or incomplete. And what I hope to do today, aside from boring you to death with a little bit of my own research, is to try to give you a broader perspective of how partisanship not only has shaped climate politics to, until today, but at the end we'll talk a little bit about how it may shape climate politics moving forward. In some ways good, in some ways quite terrible. Anyway, so we'll proceed really in two to three parts, depending on how long it takes me to get through parts one and part two. To start, we'll focus on the trajectory and the history of climate partisanship. Some of this will be familiar to you, some of it may not. But we'll try in part two to unpack some of the issues in that original understanding that's been produced largely by social scientists and sociologists. Um, and then in part three, we'll try to look ahead. Um, the current situation is not going to last forever know anything about politics, which I think probably all of you do. It's that polit politics and political systems and dynamics change all the time as our economy changes, as our culture changes. Um, so too do political systems and political processes. Um, and we'll try to look ahead a little bit um, to some things that are changing. We'll talk a little about the Green New Deal. We'll talk about um, the way young Republicans are starting to think about climate change quite differently than their uh, boomer parents and grandparents. It's always the boomer's fault, sorry. <laughs> um, and then we will talk a little bit about maybe the scariest aspect of climate partisanship, which is how climate politics are starting to interact with the rise of, the, of authoritarianism, both in the United States and abroad. And hopefully my clicker will work. It's been giving me trouble this semester. I've had it for four years. Apparently these things don't last very long. Hmm. So to start, do you recognize this woman? Chance? It's Catherine Hayhoe. Um, she's a climate scientist, an atmospheric scientist um, at Texas Tech University. She's gotten a lot of press coverage, not only for her science, but actually more so for her advocacy, in particular the way that she talks about science communication. And one of the things about Catherine Hayhoe that absolutely drives me nuts, sorry Catherine if you're on the YouTube feed, hopefully you're not, I can't imagine why you would be, is that what she really talks about all the time is um, that the main problem with climate partisanship is that Republicans just don't believe the science. This is the narrative you've probably been hearing. It's hard for me to believe that some of you have been alive for like only 18 years. But your entire lives is that Republicans just don't believe the science. We call this climate science denial. 
right? And you've probably seen polls that show that 99% of Democrats believe that climate change is happening and 25% of Republicans believe climate change is happening. And this is routinely presented as the underlying force of climate partisanship that is stalling action on climate policy. I told you this thing's giving me problems. The issue with this is that the public doesn't understand any scientific issue particularly well. 10% of Americans think the Earth is flat. That's mortifying. 66% of Americans believe that angels are literally real. That means that it's probably a lot of you. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to attack you. I'm just saying it's not a particularly scientific idea. If you want to believe it, that's great. It's actually very important uh, for where we're going to be going. You don't have to have everything you believe be shaped by sort of the objective pursuit of empirical reality. Right? We just aren't a particularly scientifically informed public. And I don't mean that as a judgment. It's just very, very hard to be scientifically informed about everything. And in fact, a lot of you probably are more confident than you should be about how scientifically informed you are about a whole host of issues. And this is a really important distinction. We're going to come back to this in part two. Science does not make decisions for us. It does not make policy. It is not a singular, uniform way of understanding, perceiving, and adapting to the world. It's just one piece. And what climate science the climate science denial narrative really misses is that science isn't the only force shaping the way that people think and act. And it's very active in our partisan differences and how we think about and respond to climate change. But to start, let's review a little bit part one here. What we know about climate partisanship. So climate historians, uh, environmental historians, usually point to 1988 as the origins of our public discussion of climate change. And that's because that's when James Hansen, NASA climate scientist, went to Congress and told the world that we were the Earth was getting warmer. And it was happening because we were burning fossil fuels primarily. Interestingly enough, 10 years later, in 1998, there was no difference between Republicans and Democrats and how they thought about climate change. We were in agreement, in equal proportions I should say, about whether the Earth was in fact getting warmer. But over the course of the next decade, there was a huge divergence in how Republican and Democratic voters started to think about this problem. Now, I know I have a, a lot of undergrads here. I'm going to click her to work. For the undergrads, what do you notice about this trend? Besides the fact that there's a gap, what else? It's a little bit Republicans have made, like, made more consistent, but Democrats have increasingly believed yeah. more and more. This story is always about Republicans. This is a story about both parties and what's happened on both sides of the aisle. Republicans haven't changed. They have been this way for the entirety of the public discussion about climate change. It's actually Democratic voters who have changed the most. We're going to come back to this in a little bit as we talk about um, elite-driven polarization. So keep this in mind. So let's start with this. So why didn't so why didn't Republican voters change in the way that Democrats did? Right? Democrats didn't come out of the womb believing that climate science, uh, believing in the climate science. Right? There was something happening socially that caused this divergence. Generally, the answer comes in the form of what's called the climate change counter movement. You may be familiar with this, maybe not by term, but when we talk about the climate change counter movement, what we're referring to, and I'll borrow the, the definition from Bull, Bull here, are corporations, largely the kind that you'd associate with fossil fuels, so energy companies and utilities in particular, allied with trade associations, conservative think tanks, think the Heritage Foundation, uh, philanthropic foundations, think the Koch brothers, um, and public relations firms. There was a network of groups who had a vested interest in protecting the production and consumption of fossil fuels, who collaborated to really do two things. One was to lobby and pay policymakers to not act on climate change. They were particularly successful on one side of the aisle. Um, but they had a concurrent program of trying to sow uncertainty around climate science. Right? This is a story that hopefully a lot of you are already very familiar with. And what you can see if we, <coughs> sorry, um, the story goes that this effort, this public relations campaign, worked. It kept Republicans from following that same trajectory as Democrats. 
there is a ton of research, um, you know, lest you doubt this is actually the case. Um, this is from uh, Justin Farrell at Yale University, I believe this is from a PNAS or Nature paper, where he actually modeled the relationship between these organizations. And what you're looking at here are really three things. You're looking at corporate funded climate change counter movement organizations, which are in green. You're looking at um, non-corporate funded climate change counter movement organizations in red, and then of course the links and relationships between them. And what this shows really is two things. One is that at the center of this, orga of this organization, this network of groups, were these large corporate funded organizations. And when we talk about corporate funding, we're actually amazingly largely talking about two things. We're talking about Coke Industries and ExxonMobil. I know it's so cliche, it's painful when cliches turn out to be true. But what the other thing that Justin shows here is that the closer these organizations got to the center of that network, to the Koch, to the Koch Foundation and to ExxonMobil, was that their message got more and more similar, right? There was a coherent story coming out of this whole network because of the efforts really of two large corporations, right? This is what we mean when we talk about an organized effort at denying the science of climate change. It was this. It was the Koch brothers. It really was. It's so painful when cliches turn out to be true. It really bothers me. It's one of my pet peeves. But that's really only part of the story here. And this is where I want to return to the bipartisan, uh, elite-driven polarization that I mentioned earlier. One of the things that political scientists talk about, my favorite ideas in political science, is the idea of elite signaling. Now, because you're all good uh, democratic, I should say, you all love democracy, you probably think that the way things work is that you all as a public form opinions about things because you're very thoughtful and careful, and then you go and you elect people who uh, agree with those things, and they put those ideas into action. It turns out that's not really what happens, that a lot of public opinion is formed at the elite level and then voters actually adapt to the ideas and attitudes and policy positions of elites. And again, no judgment. You're in too complex of an informational environment to form coherent ideas about every single policy issue. It's literally impossible. Even if you're so informed, you spend all your time reading about policy, please don't do that, um, you have more life than that, you still are not going to be informed about a whole host of things. It's shocking how much policy actually gets made at the federal level and the state level and the local level. You're just not. And so as a shortcut, we tend to follow the views of people we see as our uh, in-group elites, right? And in particular, that might actually be the people that you vote for and the uh, leaders of those political parties in particular. Um, what's critical here, um, sorry, I just wanted to show you the, the actual flow of, of information here, is that this is bipartisan. So the story here tends to focus on the climate change counter movement. It, it suppressed belief about the scientific consensus on climate change among the Republicans. But the exact same thing happened on the left. That the Democratic Party, which one of its major donors and supporters is the environmental movement, actively <coughs> pushed the idea that climate change was happening, right? Believe the science, right? There were huge efforts by the environmental movement, along with a whole host of new climate change organizations, to push this idea on the left. And as it got adopted by democratic elites, so too you see the rise in belief among the left uh, at the public level. Right? Again, this was not just the right-wing phenomenon. Elite signaling was occurring among both parties, being driven by movements on very different ends of this particular conflict. This was a political issue from the get-go. And the science just got wrapped up in it. So, this is what we call elite-driven polarization. Um, might be a little bit different way of sort of thinking about it. But the implication here is actually pretty clear. If the climate change counter movement was stopped, and there's a lot of effort to try to <coughs> halt or uh, push back against the climate change counter movement, then Republicans might start to accept climate science. And if climate science denial goes away, what do we get? Climate policy, beautiful bipartisan climate policy. That is, unless Republicans already do believe in climate change and do believe in the climate science. So this is a, a figure from a report led by Richard, uh, Richard Krosnick at Stanford University. He's a very famous uh, survey researcher. Uh, a couple years ago with uh, Resources for the Future, did this massive, probably the biggest public opinion survey on climate change that I'm aware of. 
that looked at how Americans tend to think about it. Among that, they sliced it by partisan ID, and you can see here very clearly what's going on. 67% of Republicans now believe that the Earth is getting warmer. 69% believe that this is caused by human activity. And a majority, in most cases, um, sorry, I'm used to looking at the slides as a teacher, and now I'm going to be having to look at the, the screen, um, believe that this will be a fairly serious problem. They actually see it as a social problem. The idea that voters on the right deny the reality of climate science and don't see this as a thing that might be harmful is wrong. It's not true. Which raises the question that gets into part two here and really motivated my own research, which was how the hell can you possibly explain opposition to climate policy on the right if there's no more denial about the science? The hypothesis, the narrative is about why there was this opposition to climate policy is gone or is certainly not particularly strong looking on the surface. So before I talk a little bit about my, my own study where I tried to examine this, I want to offer a competing hypothesis. And in my own work, we'll try to compare these hypotheses empirically. The reality is that the climate change kind of movement didn't pop up out of nothing. It's actually just the latest manifestation of what has been a rolling conflict between conservative elites and the conservative movement and science generally. So a very long time ago for my boomers, sorry boomers, I mean to call you out. Uh, you probably remember conflicts over the teaching of evolution in public schools. Or you could be me and you grew up in a very conservative part of central Pennsylvania and then you lived that recently, right? There has just been conflict for a long time around a whole host of scientific issues that the right has taken issue with. More recently, we can look at um, opposition to critical race theory. I know that's not how maybe how some of you think about science, but I'm a sociologist, so that's science. Um, those things are facts, those things are true. And what you're seeing is a right-wing reaction against those scientific ideas and their application in the public school system. Um, um, yeah, sorry, so what you're seeing in both of those cases, whether it's the teaching of evolution in the public school system or opposition to critical race theory being taught in the public school system, is really a conflict between science and what it, the ideas that it's producing, the ways it's offering us to see the world and understand the world, is coming into conflict with different aspects of conservative ideology. Where in the case of evolution, it's more mostly a religious component of conservative ideology, and with critical race theory, it's who knows. Um, I could speculate, but I'm on YouTube, so I'm not going to do that. Um, the other aspect of the conservative movement that tends to come into conflict with science, and particularly with climate science and climate policy, is the economic component of conservative, conservative ideology. I will unfortunately talk about that less than I would like to today, because I think it's a very important subject. But conservative economic ideology simply does not see a role for the government in the economy unless it's promoting uh, a very small subset of specific industries or specific special interests. Um, this is a part of conservative ideology that really became very aggressive in the 1980s as the New Deal political order started to collapse and was replaced by what we would call neoliberal political, uh, the neoliberal economic order. Um, as we'll talk about in a second, this is like enormously critical for understanding the making of climate policy because climate policy means the government getting involved in the economy, full stop. There's no way to do it otherwise. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. It's really just a matter of how far you want the government to go or what particular ways you want the government to get involved in the economy in order to kind of create the policies that we need. You, some of you probably have these in your, in your lawns. You drive me a little crazy. Yeah, science is real. That's true. Um, you know, it's common that folks on the left, sorry, I feel like I'm attacking all of you because you're probably all politically aligned with me. I assure you that's not the case. I love all of you. You're all great just for being here. I love you. Um, so please don't take offense. You know, it's very common for Democrats, uh, you know, sort of Democratic voters, to so just think that Republicans are anti-science. They just don't like science. Science is bad. It's how you get signs like this that say science is real as if the only people who believe that science is real are Democratic voters. This is, of course, completely outlandish. Conservatives love science. Science is great, particularly if you're in a STEM field, right? If you're doing engineering that has economic, uh, if you're doing some kind of engineering research that has economic value, you're going to produce some kind of widget that can be sold for lots of money, conservatives love you. Great, right? There's lots of bipartisan support for science. It's just not all science, because some kinds of science 
become over time extremely political. And it's for the reasons that we just talked about. It's because those scientific findings generate ideas about the world that are actually in conflict with other ways of thinking about the world, whether it's religious ideas about how the world is, does operate or ought to operate, or economic ideas about how the economy should or should not function, right? We tend, particularly on the left, to think that science is just this objective thing and you should just trust the science. You really shouldn't. Science is very political. Certain kinds of scientific findings are produced for political reasons. There's a long history of, the, uh, of demonstrating this in science and technology studies. Can you hold your question till the very end? Just throw your hand up. You can be the first response, first question. Um, right. This is an important thing to remember as we start to talk about bipartisan or uh, climate partisanship. So there have been some really interesting studies in the sociological literature that tries to examine how science became so polarized. Because it really hasn't always been the case. Science has always been political, right? But it hasn't necessarily been politicized along partisan lines. And in fact, up until the 1970s, it wasn't. So I know this like will break some of your, your brains here. It's a very messy looking graph. It's actually from Gesho's paper. Um, what you're looking at here, these are moderates and their level of trust in science. Think about these numbers here as percentages. What you're seeing is here essentially the percentage of partisans who trust science. This is a question that comes from the general social survey. And what you can see is in 1974, for a few years there, Democrat or liberals and conservatives had the same level of trust in science. But then you start to see a divergence to the point that by about 2010, only about or about 50% of liberals would say that they generally trust science, and about 40% of um, or, sorry, 40% of conservatives would say, well, actually a little less than 40% of conservatives would have said they trust science. So there's been a fairly stark divergence. Unless you think that things have gotten better, I assure you it has gotten much, much worse. What do you think happened here? You know, it takes a lot of imagination and intellectual effort to try to understand. COVID did not help this particular problem. In fact, it's really escalated it quite dramatically. Um, anyhow, um, so Gachot, in trying to explain this, I think captures it really nicely, and if you'll uh, allow me, I'd like to actually read the excerpt from the paper because why, why not give the guy credit for an excellent study? Science's cultural authority has grown, especially among legal, political, and economic institutions, to the point that the scientific community inevitably becomes entangled in polarized conflicts, for example, economic growth versus environmental sustainability. How convenient for me that he wrote that. As a result, science is increasingly seen as being polarized and not disinterested. This is what happened over the course of American history. Science started as this sort of isolated thing with people off in their lab doing whatever, but it grew in its cultural and economic and political importance. It had a lot to say about a whole bunch of things that we have to make decisions about, which really gets at the heart here, that science started to come into conflict with other social forces that helped guide how we made decisions. This is where John Evans comes in. John Evans is a sociologist at say UC San Diego. Sorry, John, I got that wrong. Um, what John Evans argues is that what's really at the heart of this divide, the splintering around trust in science, is that Democrats and Republicans, where they really differ on science, is simply the degree to which you value it as a tool for making collective decisions. So what happened on the left for a whole bunch of sort of economic, political economic reasons, is that the left became more educated, more scientifically literate. The kinds of work that they do increasingly relied on the use of science. And what you start to see is a group of people who start to see science as very valuable, very useful, actually a very powerful tool for guiding collective decision making. And what you've seen on the right for a very different political reason is a group of people who've seen science challenge traditional modes of thinking about collective decisions, whether that's, again, religion or sort of conservative economic free market ideology, you start to see science become politicized and a source of, uh, see it become politicized because of the ways that it differentially impacts how Republicans and Democrats think about collective decision making. This has a, an enormous and very important implication here, which is that climate partisanship is not fundamentally about uh, climate science, it's actually about climate policy, and it's always been about climate policy. 
uh, as I wrote, haha, this is part of the partisan, this, that is, part of the partisan climate gap is driven not by lack of belief in scientific claims by conservatives, but by a long standing and broad concern of the moral influence of scientific practice in public life. Okay, I'm going to have to fly because I'm taking longer than I thought, as predicted. Um, I'm going to move through this fairly quick. I'm more than happy to take any questions about this specific paper, but I'll just show you a few things. So I wrote a paper, amazingly, two years ago. Feels like a lifetime. I wanted to directly compare these two ideas, right? To what degree um, can we explain partisan differences in support for climate policy based on denial of climate science or trust in science very generally, right? Thankfully, I married up intellectually, and my wife, who's here and is now currently blushing very heavily, gave me a great idea. She's a demographer. She appointed a, a particular research method to me that would allow me to actually look at the percentage of that difference in support for climate policy between Republicans and Democrats for each of those two hypotheses. And so after she taught me how to do it, and I still can't particularly tell you how I did it, and she, she assured me it was correct, um, <laughs> I went out and did it. Right? So I collected some survey data. I'm gonna, I'll skip over a lot of this. Um, this was collected in 2021. I'm really just looking at differences between Democrats and Republicans. Independents are forgotten about here. Sorry to make yourself an independent. I no longer care about you as a, 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 a subject of study. And there's really two independent variables. Uh, so there's sort of standard climate science denial, right? How certain are you that climate change is or isn't happening? This is on a six-point scale. And the second one is actually, a, I believe it's the exact same survey measure that you saw earlier, which is a general trust in science, right? I definitely trust, trust uh, definitely, probably not sure, probably not, definitely not trust science as an institution. And the outcome, which I'll just jump to really quick, um, is a 10 item scale of support for 10 different kinds of policies. And it's just on a support, do not support scale. Add it all up. If you like, if you support all of them, you get a score of 10. If you don't like any of them, you get a score of zero. There's a couple controls that you don't care. Um, so quite unlike belief in climate science, there is pretty stark differences in support for climate policies. These are a pretty diverse set of climate policies. Uh, we won't have time to talk about all of them. Um, but it really represents a whole range of different approaches to dealing with climate change, dealing with different sectors of climate emission, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and there is a, a chasm, as you can see, between Democrats and Republicans in supporting climate policy, which as a quantitative scholar, it's great. You love variability. Variability is beautiful. So again, don't worry about the table. Tables are painful. Um, we'll focus really just on this little bit. So this is the result of the decomposition analysis. And it's actually very intuitive and easy to interpret. So again, what we're looking at here is the difference between Democrats and Republicans on support for climate policy. And these independent variables, what we're generating is an estimate of the percentage of that difference that can be explained by those specific independent variables. Right? We're testing those two hypotheses. And not to my surprise, general trust in science explained vastly more of that difference than did belief in climate science. So the whole idea that what's at the heart of what keeps Republicans from supporting climate policy, which is that they don't, just not believing in climate science, just is not empirically true. And in fact, you get much more lever rev leverage explanatorily by thinking about a more general distrust of science and its role in collective decision making. Okay, why this matters. Um, I'm personally tired of hearing about getting Republicans to believe the science. They kind of already do. And I think I just showed you that it probably doesn't matter in the first place. If you want to understand conservative opposition to climate policy, you have to look much deeper. And you have to think about a conservative movement that's much bigger and much broader, and that is rooted in fundamental conflicts about collective decision making, in which science has become deeply uh, politicized. In fact, the root problem here, this general distrust in science, is getting worse. <laughs> it's not getting better. Uh, I don't expect it to get much better. Um, once people start to go down this path of not trusting science, it can be very hard to bring them back. These are long-term social forces that are driving this. Um, I think a nice way of framing the takeaway from this study, really from the talk in general, is that I think what the evidence shows is that when the very last Republican voter and politician says, yes, climate change is happening, there is no evidence that you're going to suddenly see bipartisan climate policy. 
that this is a much deeper rooted problem than just accepting and acknowledging the problem. So I won't go through my slides, but I'll just I'll maybe prep you a little bit um, for some q and A. I have to actually have slides on all of this. I'm happy to talk about all of these things. I figured I'd run out of time. <coughs> so where does this leave us? Well, I certainly personally don't have a lot of optimism that we're going to see any kind of bipartisan and major climate policy anytime soon for all the reasons that we've talked about. But there are a whole bunch of other things that are kind of happening right now in our political and economic system that give some suggestion about how partisanship might shape climate policy moving forward. The most exciting for me personally is that a lot of folks on the left are thinking very differently about climate policy than did their predecessors and are trying to link conflicts over economic inequality, in particular to environmental issues in general, but climate change specifically, really as a way of getting beyond partisanship, by right? building a new political coalition that has not yet existed, a multiracial, multiethnic, working class coalition that sees climate change inequality as a sort of big package of policies that can solve a whole bunch of issues at once. That's one approach. I'm doing a study on that right now. Hopefully I'll have a talk in a couple of years that I can come give you. <laughs> Five years it takes to write a paper. Um, interestingly enough, uh, younger Republicans are quite different than their parents. Again, I have some cool polling data that I can show you. They're much more likely to believe that climate change is happening, but more importantly, they're much more likely to support climate policies, including a, a pretty interesting range of them. I think underneath that is actually a very different way of viewing the economy, but that's very speculative. And then the more terrifying uh, dynamic here is that one party in particular is getting awfully authoritarian. And there are lots of reasons to think that climate change could become embroiled in that rising authoritarianism. Um, one of our department's grad students who's here did an interesting master's thesis last year on this, and I actually have a slide with some information about that as well that I think is, is fascinating. So I'm all done. Please feel free, these are some references, please feel free to ask me about any of those other three, because I do have lots to say about them, but I'll open it to other questions as well. Uh, I have about 25 minutes for some Q&A. Um, so go ahead. Can I jump to my, yep. thank you for being patient. Yeah. Um, so I guess the, the first question I wanted to ask, if I can use my phone, was uh, have you ever, have you done research into like framing policy and like discussing policy between different you know, political groups? Yeah, so I, I personally have not, um, but there is plenty of research out there, right? And so there's a pretty prominent paper that got published by Leah Stokes and some of her colleagues um, at UC Santa Barbara that I tried to make the argument that packaging economic stuff with climate and environmental policy does increase support. I'm pretty skeptical of those studies in general. Um, and the reason is that, for all the reasons that we actually talked about, right? you can give somebody one piece of information and say, like, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna package the policy in this particular way by emphasizing certain aspects of it, right? That's what framing does. You might see on a survey an effect. The problem is that that's not a, an ecologically valid way of examining how people think about policy and are exposed to policy, right? Because what they're really going to do is they're going to go and look at how elites in their party talk about that. And it's from that that they'll derive their view of that particular issue. In fact, there was a really cool paper in Nature um, that looked at the Green New Deal and support for the Green New Deal. When the people were first talking about it, support was super high and bipartisan. And what they showed in the study is that as soon as Fox News started talking about it, Republican support bottomed out, right? So I, I, I'm skeptical that this is just a question of framing. I think it's about the underlying politics. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my, excuse me, uh, my next question was uh, referencing a historical uh, event, which was the, not polio, because polio was always part of history, but uh, when the polio vaccine was first uh, mass produced, um, there was no bipartisan, there was no partisan uh, denial of the, the polio vaccine. Um, and it was, uh, during that time it was framed as a civic duty. Um, versus during the COVID years, uh, after the vaccine was not produced, uh, there was major amounts of um, partisan like skepticism, you might say, uh, and like there was no talk of civic duty or you know that type of responsibility. Um, would you have any analysis on why that happened? It's the same thing, because Donald, Donald Trump said, "This is go go drink some bleach instead." Um, it's it's a it's a it's a lead driven pol it's a lead driven polarization. Um, we could have a whole class on sort of the social psychological dynamics of of, of 
partisanship. But that's your in-group. That's your thought leader. It's a horrifying thought. Um, right? And so if you're thinking about, you know, should I get a vaccine? I don't know. You know, think, think about, like, Donald Trump's, like, filling in a gap, right? Elites are filling in a gap. You don't know anything about the COVID vaccine, right? You're just hearing about it for the first time. And then you're exposed very rapidly to a flood of information that's telling you that it's bad, that it's scary, that it's problematic, that the people who are who you identify with as leaders aren't necessarily emphasizing it very strongly and maybe are kind of skeptical of it. Now, now, now that's your attitude. And I don't mean that in a, in a defamatory way at all. That's how most people learn about things in, in political environments. Uh, I saw that hand first. Sorry. I don't know, I just fully really understand, but it's like a Republican <clears throat> members, like his supporters are usually don't believe science because of their economic priority, or they're just like denying the whole climate change thing. It's, it's cognitive dissonance, right? Like, if you're hearing about climate change and someone's telling you, look, if you want to fix this, you got to address the economic roots of the problem. And the economic roots of the problem is that you've got a free market that has no environmental controls. And there's nothing, there's no mechanism in that market to try to curtail carbon emissions. So the government's going to have to create that kind of mechanism. Well, now it's in conflict with your deeply held view that the government should stay out of the economy. So what do you do? You have to, ch the only way to reconcile that cognitive dissonance is to choose one or the other. So they just so basically say that they recognize the climate change, but they just kind of deny it as like, because they believe the free market and government should not involve any economy. But that's like Republicans most view, that's what I'm learning. So I'm just like really confused. Like is it like are they actually not believing it or are they just denying it? What the situation? What I think for a while there was more widespread denial of the science. Um, I think what I showed you in one of the slides is that more recently I think there's more widespread acceptance. Republicans that it's happening. But what, the way they maybe reconcile that now is, well, that's fine, but we're not going to have the government intervene in the economy to fix it. Right? Why, and why, there's no reason you have to believe those two things. You don't have to be like, well, climate change is happening. We have to address this immediately, and it has to be through government intervention in the economy. You could be like, well, screw it. Right? There's all kind, a whole range of responses that you can have before you get to, yes, let's do something about the problem. Cassie, go ahead. So keeping in mind that framework of elite signaling, is there any mechanisms yet that describe why these young Republicans are kind of forming these different sorts of views on policy comparing, you know, compared to the elites in the party? I have yeah. no idea. That'd be a great dis uh, master's thesis, Cass. <laughs> <laughs> something to think about. Um, you know, I, but I, I personally, I personally, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting empirical question. What's happening? Go ahead. I'm also interested in the young Republicans. Um, a, how old are these? Like, are they 18 or are they 35? And, you know, about to have power. But, and also, what are the caveats? Yeah, so um, I'll just show you this. This is from Pew. Um, what you're looking at here, a percentage of adults who think the federal government is doing too little to reduce the effects of climate change. Again, so sorry, boomers. 31%, uh, Gen X, 41%, 52% of millennials and younger. Um, I guess I'm a millennial, so that's a politically active. I'm an, I'm, am I, I'm an old millennial? You're my expert on this. Um, I'm an old millennial, right? So you're seeing a, a class uh, of people who are coming into power. Of course, the boomers are really hanging on tight to power, um, <laughs> even as they blank in front of the camera. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's a, that's also a bipartisan problem. Um, so, it, you know, there, it's, it's a generational shift that's happening. We'll see. I, my, I suspect there will be a generational rush at some point as this older generation sort of loses power or that, that vacuum's going to have to be filled. I wouldn't be surprised if it's filled by younger people. But as you know particularly well, Ish, this is only 52%. The other 48% should concern us for very different reasons. Yeah, I was curious, um, I guess it's kind of two parts. One was more of an observation I thought was really interesting. Not this one, but the other one where you showed the differences in the bottom. It was the okay. belief that, um, you know, that really, you know, that, neo yeah, exactly. Um, right, where we're talking about, um, maybe this wasn't the slide, but where we're talking about sort of the, you know, the, that it hit on that neoliberal I ideology, right, of like not, non-interference or of non-action that I thought was interesting. Um, 
that was just an observation because it really like I mean that just demonstrates that one in the bottom it's like everything up top it's like okay it's that but that one on the bottom so maybe this wasn't the slide but I thought that was super interesting and then the other one I, I question I really had was in your yes this one right in the bottom that yeah, yeah. will hurt the individual respondent right at least a moderate amount and that belief that it doesn't affect them personally I thought was very telling um, you know and has like a you know and like that's it right there some real rugged individual yeah exactly exactly and then so then my second question was really uh, methodologically in your actual study did you get any demographic information on like religious belief I was just thinking of like if, if they identify as religious right because I'd be curious then if we're thinking from the that sort of same elite signaling framework right if like okay is it like maybe there's a resurgence you know is are we seeing an increase in religious identification right now or at least in this sample that might explain that that trust um, that trust in science right. component or if it's like a network thing like on your other slide right if it's like just that there's these nodes putting of these small highly influential groups that might so I just thought that was super interesting too so I was curious because so religion was not one of the controls yeah. um, my guess Stephen and this is like just a general since you're a sociology graduate student I'll, I'll give you my my two cents demographics shouldn't explain much of anything and I think in this particular case, because we're capturing what that religious identification represents, mm -hmm. like this trust of science, my guess is they it would, would be wash out. It would be interesting other. to think about comparing, maybe mm -hmm. like bifurcating this model and looking yeah. at like evangelicals versus others. Yeah. So there's other ways to think about it, but as like, as an input in the model, my guess is it wouldn't explain. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you're saying that it's um, or what I'm hearing is that it's economics that that kind of drive the Republicans on um, where they're yeah. going. So if, um, at what point do you see that the economics of cleaning up after all these disasters or, um, for example, if you live in Florida, you, you, you're getting yeah. to the point where you can't even right. get insurance because the co-insurers won't buy in. So at what point Will there be a realization that maybe it's more cost effective to prevent than to clean up? I think about the insurance thing all the time. Um, the parts of the country that are most going to struggle with flood insurance and uh, home, homeowners insurance related to the hurricane damage are deeply red parts of the country. And um, that to me is a sociologist. There's a guy, uh, Thomas Rudell, I think he's not retired. Uh, Records, who has written a book about what are called focusing events, which are these sort of exogenous shocks to our economic, political, social systems that force these coalitions of groups to fundamentally reevaluate their their position. And I've been think, waiting to, for a focusing event since I was like 19 when I first read that book. I haven't seen it yet, but the thing I've thought about for years is insurance, because if you have whole communities that can no longer insure their homes, mm -hmm. you have a, a, a genuine calamity on your hands. And it's the kind of thing that I think, you know, I, I wouldn't think about it in terms of like, well, now I now I support climate policy. I would think about it in terms of what possibilities does this open up for me, right? What are my interests now, right? And all of a sudden, yeah, you may be willing to be part of a broader coalition because the, the personal, the self-interested values is just enormous. Um, it's a very scary problem. Um, and I think it could be that kind of focusing event. That's the one I think about a lot. Um, wildfire shooting, there's just a whole set of problems really with climate change that are going to make it very hard for the status quo to continue. It's just a matter of like when, <laughs> right? When, when does that happen? Does it happen fast? Does it happen slow? What are the triggers? Um, and are there ways maybe for our capitalist system to adapt and actually maintain itself? Um, I also think with the, the focusing event that she mentioned with the hurricanes, Florida, that sort of thing. It kind of changes the graph. Previ previous graphs of that you had up there of is the this going to personally affect me? Yeah, yeah, yeah that one, yeah. <laughs> that one, and yeah. why they believe or don't believe climate change for these reasons and sort of thing. Yeah, hopefully, when those events happen, it will be clear that it's because of climate change, and not something else. Uh, I think that's important. The attribution of responsibility is very important. Good. Um, so something that you brought up uh, earlier in the slides 
about about funding counter uh, climate change mechanisms and about you know like uh, clear conflicts of interest regarding this. Um, it is about sorry, I'm catch my um, it was about how we could sort of turn the other way and like stop that from happening. It was very hard because conflicts of interest and you know billions of dollars they speak very very loudly to these companies and organizations. Um, and so would would the only be way would the only way to escape that would be to change the economic reality such that there was no you know, greater reason to support uh, these counter movements. I think there's a few things going on in your in your question. Um, you know, the fundamental problem of all politics in the United States is that we don't live in a democracy, right? You live in a society where politics is determined fundamentally by corporations and wealthy individuals who are able to fund political campaigns, right? It, I sort of like gloss over it here, right? Money is the crux of the problem, right? If you could remove money from politics, you change the incentives of elected officials in, in very profound ways, right? If you no longer are beholden to some corporate benefactor or if the Koch brothers don't have the capacity to, or Peter Thiel don't have the capacity to single-handedly fund whole election efforts to put people in power, then the whole system starts to change, right? So I think that's like the main conflict of interest, right? Is that the people you're, that are in power aren't interested in you. They're interested in a very small number of people who, whose interests don't reflect the vast majority of the other people's, and particularly in relation to climate change, right? It does not benefit anybody to allow climate change to happen unless you own an oil and gas refinery. Right, like you're you're the only group that really benefits. Um, I think policies like the Green New Deal have whole programs to help people transition out of the fossil fuel industry, the re regular workers. They also want to jail executives, which is a whole other thing. Uh, I don't support that. Um, and now I think I forgot the other part of what I was going to say. <laughs> well, that's that long. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your grace there. That's it. Has um. Has the internet kind of changed, uh, fragmented what kind of makes up uh, elite signalers in particular public lives? I have no idea, but I will speculate. I'm a good social scientist. Um, I think it probably changes who can count as an elite. You know, if you had to rely on the mainstream media to get a message out and to influence people, you would have had to have been somebody who was in a position of authority or power before. Now you don't. Now you just need a YouTube channel, as Tate and his ilk and Ben Shapiro, et cetera, demonstrate, right? They have this ability to just like reach a huge audience with a YouTube channel. And so I think who counts as an elite changes. Um, or I should say, who has capacity to get other people to identify them as an elite changes. That is fully speculative. So, so take that with a large hunk of salt. We have time for one more question or two more questions? If, if not, I've got a question for you. Oh, hang on. Thank you. I'll let you. I'll give you time. I'll be quick. I think for kids, so much more. Well, so 
kind of speculate again. I think part of that perception may be a problem of selecting on the dependent variable a little bit. Republicans have no problem controlling people's behavior. <laughs> That's not an issue for Republicans. I think it's it's really about core values. It's about what what specific things Republicans believe that just bumps into the other way of thinking, the more liberal ideology in which science is much more prominent. Right? I, I gave just a couple examples, whether it's uh, critical race theory or um, evolution. There's like a long history of these things where like, okay, science is clearly pointing us in one direction and traditional religious views are pointing us in a very different direction and they're not commensurate, they're not compatible. And it's clear to me historically how conservatives got to this point. As I was making this, it actually occurred to me that I didn't have a very good narrative for how uh, Democrats got it to be this particular way. I think a big part of it is changes in education, in educational polarization, right? So now, like, 90% of uh, college graduates are Democrats, right? This is now the crux of the Democratic Party. And these are people who have been inundated not only with lots of scientific education, but the idea that science is in fact critical to how we operate as a society. When you come here, part of your hidden curriculum is we're all trying to convince you that science is great, right? Like it's, it's embedded in everything that we teach you, everything we expose you to. So I think that's a big part of it. I just, there's a whole slew of literature on partisanship that I don't have time to talk about, but like it has become this very powerful organizing social force. Um, Liliana Mason, you might be familiar with since you're a political scientist, talks about this like a mega identity. I think that's totally fair. Um, I also think we've under theorized about how partisanship has operated. I think it's not an accident. I don't think it's even bad. I think that political parties are really good at organizing people around shared interests. And they've gotten too good, maybe. <laughs> or maybe our political system, because the way it's set up, is forcing us into these big tent or like very small numbers groups instead of allowing us to diversify intellectually and all our values. But it's forced us into these really tight boxes. And because of elite driven polarization, because of the way we tend to think, a lot of the things we're, we, we believe and act on, they don't come to us from organically. It's because we're part of this group. Right? But that really is a bipartisan phenomenon. Research shows that that's, that's quite bipartisan. You have, I think you have okay. like two minutes. Two I've minutes. got a quick question. Okay. Um, so, so you've talked about ideology and partisanship uh, as being different, and they are in lots of ways. But I wonder if you've thought about decoupling them a lot more than you have. Yeah. And, and the reason is because there's a lot of anti-science on the left. In yes. fact, before COVID, most of the anti-vaxxers were from the left, right? At least in Um and, and so it has less to do with ideology, it seems to me, and a lot more to do with partisanship, and in particular partisanship we're having right now. And so I wonder if you've given any thought to the impact of populism and how it's impacted the Republican Party much more than the Democratic Party. There's populism on both sides, but it, it has taken over the Republican Party, the, the elites and yeah. the Republican Party. And there is a, an embedded uh, dialogue in populism, which is anti-elitism, right? So it's not just anti-science, it's anti-elitism. Yeah. Experts who can tell us how to run our lives. So I wonder if this is really much more an aspect, especially in, in recent years, the last decade or so, yeah. on the Republican Party is a, is a result of, of uh, populism. Right. Um, this is where issue should stand up and talk to me. Um, this probably isn't an exact response here. Um, I think you raised a number, you said a lot there, Cornell. There's a couple of things that are really important. I completely agree with you that anti-science sentiment is out there on the left. It's weaker, just empirically, it's, it's weaker. Um, we talked about Depends on what science you ask them about. Ask them about economic science. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna respond to that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, sucked me in there, bring up economic data. Um, I, I don't think about populism as much as I do this. And partly this has emerged out of a lot of conversations with Ish Green, who's over there, is one of our students who wrote their master's thesis on this. I worry more about the rise of really anti-democratic sentiment, right? That, so and it flows from what you're saying, right? Like if you don't trust elites, then you don't trust political elites. And of course, who, is, who are the least popular professionals in the United States? 
Who has the lowest favorability rating of any professional group in the United States? Lawyers. It's members of Congress. <laughs> by, by far. Nobody likes political elites. Nobody trusts political elites. That is a bipartisan phenomenon. Um, less so scientific ones. Unfortunately, one of the things that can flow from a lack of trust and faith in political elites is that all of a sudden you don't trust the system itself. And you start looking for outsiders who can lead you astray. And this is frighteningly a very bipartisan thing. So I'm actually going to finally move away from my horrible podium. Um, this was a, from Isha's uh, master's thesis. One of the questions we asked was, do you agree with the statement that it's more important to save our environment than our democracy? 37% um, of Democrats agreed with that statement. It appeared actually only 16% of Republicans. That's probably because they don't want to save the democ democ or democracy at all. So it might just be a question of wording. Um, what you see here is actually, this was a, a, a battery of questions where we were trying to measure really like ecological authoritarianism or, or eco-fascism. It was quite bipartisan, but on very different dimensions. 33% of Democrats think we need to lower the amount of people on the planet. That is messed up. Um, you don't know why, take Social 332 and I'll teach you. Um, this is a deeply like problematic and like horribly, has this kind of thinking has a horrible legacy, um, largely on the left. Uh, Paul Ehrlich really propagated this idea, the famous uh, biologist. Um, so I think more about the lack of trust in political elites in the system itself, and that can get to a scary point, right? Um, where you start to see openings for non-democratic political systems to rise. And I don't think that the left is a barrier to that, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but anyway, I think I am officially yeah, I think our time's about yes. up. Uh, before uh, I ask you to join, <coughs> join me in thanking uh, Dylan for a really fascinating conversation, uh, let me tell you about two things. One is, actually in a couple of weeks, we have Bob Ingram coming, uh, relevant to what we were discussing today. Uh, he's actually a former member of Congress, a Republican, a uh, born-again Christian who's formed in a, a group that takes uh, climate change very seriously and wants to see Christians act on it and Republicans act on it and conservatives act on it. So he's coming in a couple of weeks. Next week we have Asim Prakash, from the, he's the director of the Center for Environmental Politics at the University of Washington. He's going to be discussing does uh, climate activism and protests actually make a difference? Does it change anything? And that will be a fascinating conversation as well, so I encourage you to come and join us next week. That's next Thursday, by the way, not next Tuesday. But join me now in, in thanking uh, Dylan for a really <laughs>